Okay, we are recording. Hello, Piot. Hi, Rob. <laughs> so this is my buddy Piot, who lives in Tokyo. And you've been there, what, 15, 16 years now? 20. 20? Exactly, oh. 20 years. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, so I don't uh, kind of butcher it up. Do you want to give a quick introduction in terms of who you no, are? No, no, just try, try to introduce me, Rob. And, and actually, um, one thing I will say is because I'm in New York City and Piat is in Tokyo, uh, and this particular iteration of conversation, it's his evening, it's my morning, so I'm going to call it coffee and, and, and wine. red wine. Yeah. It's not but a please, particularly uh, Japanese drink, is it? it but, yeah, um, it's quintessential. So, quintessential. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about who you are. The, the Cliff Notes version. Well, I, I thought actually, Rob, it would be way more interesting, uh, I think, to your listeners and um, to me, if you introduced me in, in one way or another, I'd, I'd like to hear your framing. Huh. And then okay. I'll respond to your f framing. <clears throat> so a couple of things. Um, in no particular order. So Piat is a provocateur, I would say, uh, a man who is interested in kind of shaping, shaking up individuals and organizations. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, a, uh, an author, a prolific author, uh, a polyglot, um, uh, a little devil, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> And um, you can, yeah, go ahead. Why don't you add to that a little bit? No, it's, it's, it's probably, Rob, it's probably one of the kindest intro introductions that you've ever made, uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is great not to uh, put you on the spot, but uh, I appreciate um, everything you said. Yes, I'd, I'd agree. I, I think um, definitely provocative approaches to change um, uh, I'd agree to the entrepreneurial spirit. I'd agree to, um, well, the authoring, um, maybe not prolific. So I'm on my 14th book right now. Um, <laughs> but, but definitely. I, I, I Underachiever. Think we've, yes, we've clicked. We've clicked uh, for how many years? 2008, I think, was when I met, or seven when I met you here in Tokyo. Oh, I thought it was earlier than that, but uh, I'm not well, sure. Let's, let's to... not quarrel, but I think it's been over... Uh, well, 12 or 13 years, which is like a teenage relationship, right? Right, through Charlie-san. Through Charlie-san, Charlie, our beloved friend who um, lives now in Thailand and uh, had lived in Japan for, I think, almost 30 years and um, invested his time heavily in developing various change approaches based on bodywork, right? Aikido and NLP. And, and then we happened to go to one of his workshops you happen to be visiting tokyo and i happened to just visit his workshop and we met and then we clicked and had a drink and then uh had uh i i, I don't know how many drinks since then but probably <laughs> thousands uh, yeah i would say so and i was thinking who is this guy and you asked a question that i've seen you ask almost everybody that that you meet, which is, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and what do you really want, Rob? And, and what do and, you want it for? And you asked me so intensely. And, uh, and then I'm like, okay, what, and you're like, no, seriously, what do you want? <laughs> so that's a, that's a yeah. question that you like yeah. to ask. And it's I have, it's a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, please. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. Uh, I, 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 we we had a banter before starting this recording, and uh, for ev anyone who listens to that, I, I think it's important to um, frame things in one way or another. When um, you know, when when we we present ourselves to to people who may not know us, but um, I, I think the the question, "What do you really want?" is uh, is one of the driving questions in my. Um, identity. I was born in Poland in 1975 when Poland, well, it was at that time a communist country behind the Iron Wall, 
So for anyone in New York, I'd say um, it, it's probably a bit of, of, of science fiction or history mystery. It's if you imagine the country, you could compare my country at that time is probably North Korea right now. Or my, well, maybe some other countries as well, but but uh, a um, closed um, area with um, well. Um, not really democratic approaches to um, to to human life um, and in uh, 1981 when I was six years old uh, we had well, people may know we we had um, martial law introduced because uh, of the solidarity movement that started actually right now we can say that um, not many people say that but actually uh, we know that CIA, FBI, or whoever, whoever it, it was, the Japanese, uh, sorry, the American, not Japanese, the American, um, uh, well, administration or government was involved in helping solidarity fight um, the communist regime and, and, and the Soviet occupation. So uh, Lech Wałęsa, who then became the president of Poland, who I met here in Japan in two, 2006, mm -hmm. um, was arrested at that time and then um, the Soviet army um, well, practically occupied Poland and, and, and the state continued for about five years you know, since I was six, probably to 12. Um, and uh, so I grew up in, 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 in these times where really knowing what you want was essential to survival but because of, you know, things were not there. Um, it wasn't easy to get a piece of chocolate. It wasn't easy to get some coffee. It wasn't easy to get alcohol. You know, you had to really fight for those things. Uh, mm. Food was rationed. Um, um, you know, activities were um, very, um, what's the right word? Um, well, controlled, I think. Mm. Um, so in a sense, you know, I... Um, I'm very used to environments like the one right now where we're facing um, social distancing, we're facing uh, maybe rationing and in, in, in access to some things like, well, Tokyo is not as, as closed as New York right now. We don't have a, a complete lockdown, uh, but it's still more and more difficult to get access to your entertainment and pleasures of life uh, as it used to be uh, maybe six months ago. Mm. Um, so I, I think coming back to your, your, your comment, knowing what you want um, and um, really being able to express it. So self-awareness and then um, self-expression uh, are, are probably two of, of the things that I, um, well, two of many things that I really, really appreciate in life and, and having relationships with people, I think it's very important to be able to really express what you want. Mm -hmm. What do you really want and what you want it for um, so that there's way more clarity on how the interactions can proceed. Mm. And I think it's, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing right now with everyone in this uh, interesting Cheers, circumstance. Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Um, I think asking what do you want right now is a very different question. I don't, I don't think people are asking it in the, in the bigger sense of how you ask me and how you ask people in general. I think right now uh, people are getting in touch with what do I want and, and a lot of it has to do with a desire to go back to the way that things were or go back to my creature comforts mm. and, and, we, and, and and then like all the survival instincts are kicking in. Um, uh. I, had, <laughs> I had a different question for you though. Um, Go ahead. A, a rather light question. Well, I was thinking about it. you and I spoke last night, my time as well. And, and I had seen you the other day on a, on a um, Instagram live feed and the, uh, the, what, what occurred to me is, oh, he, you know, he's very Genki. And, and I thought maybe you could explain wh what is Genki uh, <laughs> for, for our non-Japan living. Uh, That's interesting. Viewers. You know, it's a, it's a linguistic trick right now, but Genki, uh, you know, in English, it means energetic. It means 
um, energized probably. It means some other things. I, I think it's, it's cheerful, you know, cheerful um, as well. Um, I think, um, you know, in, in, in Japanese, you often ask uh, a person as a, as a greeting, genki desu ka, which is, you know, are you, are you healthy? Uh, mm. Are you cheerful? Are you, are you in your zone? Yeah. And, um, and I think it's, um, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm probably not making any sense here, but it's a, a, a two-edged sword in a sense. It's in, in one way, um, uh, I think we all have to create uh, a, an image, uh, and especially if, you, if you're interacting with media, if you're on um, live streaming. I mean, here we're recording right now, but still we have to be Genki to a certain mm. degree. And on the other hand, you have to put yourself in a, in a um, constructive physical and emotional state to be able mm. to interact uh, with reality. And especially, I, I think both you and I, um, we do have um, very interesting but, but yet uh, challenging jobs uh, if you're working with change, if you're working with people um, looking for uh, answers or maybe the right questions to get to those answers. If you're working with people trying to solve big problems, um, be that in the coaching environment, be that in, in the team environment, organizational environment, um, mm. clients and, and whatnot. Um, you, you need to be in your zone. You need to be in your Genki zone, right? So you need to be focused on what's happening right now. What's um, um, I, I, I think for many people right now, that's a great place to start is to, to take a moment and notice where am I at? Where's my state? Because I think yeah. many, many people right now are not Genki. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. and, and people are dealing with the unknown by sort of being back on their heels a little bit. Um, <laughs> and just noticing that and going, okay, is this the best state with which to respond to this situation and, and do something? Um, now you have, a, you have a lot of experience in companies, uh, you know, large companies. And one question I wanted to throw out for you is, um, what do you think, uh, makes a company that is is adaptable is agile and able to respond in in this type of type of circumstance i think it happens uh -huh. on the scale of the individual and it happens on the scale of a organization or a team so that's an interesting question and just for some context for anyone who's who's watching us um, i worked at morgan stanley and i worked at google um so both Wall Street finance uh, environment uh, throughout actually the, the Lehman shock um, financial crisis and, and then Google uh, later on and um, I, I think that, I, I think there are differences um, you, you could look at finance and technology as very different environments but there's actually probably more similarities than than differences both companies are extremely fast in decision making mm. and uh, they are very agile in um, crowd sourcing ideas um, mm. so um, I don't know if Sundar Pichai uh, would agree with me right now um, I'm happy Sundar if you want to talk to have the conversation uh, but um, actually um, Eric Schmidt uh, mentions it in, in the media. Google, for example, is uh, very bottom-up in terms of uh, ideating. So mm. in terms of looking for solutions to problems, in terms of um, creating ideas for new projects, uh, in terms of solving problems for users. But it's, it's also, it, it can be extremely fast and extremely top down in terms of making very crucial business decisions mm. so um, i'm not sure if you're uh, for example familiar with the canavan framework of um which um, sorry canavan 
kind of mm. in framework, yeah. which is a, um, a, 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 pro a problem solving framework. So uh, if you imagine that there are technical problems and adaptive problems, so that in the technical space, you have very simple problems. So for example, if you cut your finger and <laughs> you're, ble you're bleeding, it's a very simple problem. There's always the best, um, best practice. So mm. the best practice would be to quickly look for um, maybe a piece of tissue paper to, to stop bleeding and then um, maybe for some uh, other things to make sure that the bleeding doesn't continue and that the wound is clean. Uh, and then you have more complicated problems, for example, um, the IT space is, is filled with complicated problems. Um, a lot of, uh, for example, accounting are complicated problems where you need to find where actually the mistake is. You need to go through your Excel spreadsheets or through your code and uh, identify the, 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 the right um, well, lever, uh, lever to, to solve the problem. And then you, you may have uh, good practice, which means to find the, the problem and the solution, you may have different uh, ways, and you may have different approaches, you may have different methodologies, but you can still find the right answer. Uh, but then if you go to the adaptive problems, which are normally the complex problems and the chaotic yeah. problems, the reality changes, right? So uh, on the technical and side- And there's no one solution, right? Yes. There's no one yes. problem area. But I'm yeah, gonna so put in my earbuds so we don't get another- that's thing. fine. So on the, on, the, on the technical side, you need to make sure that you first sense and categorize uh, and act, right? But if you go to the adaptive side, you need to act first and then sense and then uh, maybe categorize. So, so first you need to um, take small steps and, and, and maybe um, it's not Google, but in Facebook uh, terms, break things, right? So you need to, to make movements and see what works, what doesn't work, discover, sense, see patterns, and then repeat the patterns. So uh, in Google terms, you have the uh, famous launch and iterate uh, terminology or fail fast terminology. Mm. And, and that's, that's exactly actually how my, my approach to, to life works, which is, you know, don't overthink, uh, just, just try, right? So move, 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 uh, move fast and break things. And break, by breaking things means provoke. And by provoking, determine what um, the environment actually um, wants, uh, determine what sort of responses you can get from people and then act on those responses. So it's rapid experimentation. Yes. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting. It's not a, uh, it's not an approach like, you know, in software waterfall approach where you're trying to figure out what the market wants or understand that completely before acting. It's let's throw something out and see what happens. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting because with complex problems, there isn't one solution. So there, there's no one place to apply a lever. Uh -huh. And so my understanding in, in that type of systems thinking is it's best to think about a direction of where you want to go and then begin iterating. Yes. Um, and that, there's also another thing you, which uh, I think if I look at my own history and, and, and the pattern of um, educating myself, going, to, going through schooling and, and, and some other ways to learn. Um, I think there's also the importance of determining what to um, throw away uh, early. So learning is very important, meaning testing and, and, and seeing what, what works, what doesn't, but also unlearning. So simply determining which patterns uh, in your behavior, in, in your business, in your relationships are not actually constructive and getting rid of those patterns. And, and for, for majority of us, uh, it's, a, it's an extremely painful process, right? It's like shedding your skin. And in, in, in mm. Japanese, I actually uh, like to use the term dappi, um, which is, you know, the snake shedding skin, which is mm. for the snake, it's an extremely painful process, apparently. But uh, snakes that are not able to shed their skins apparently die. Right, so you need to you need to to be able to go through the, this painstaking process of of 
um, throwing away a part of your identity, um, but in that process, discovering something new. And yeah, we were, we were talking about that a little bit before, before this call that I think one of the biggest challenges right now to people's ability to, to be adaptable, to be agile is unconsciously wanting to hold on to the way things are or the way things have been. And that holding on creates a rigidity and creates suffering as the Buddhists would say. So, Mm. well, suffering is important. I think, I, I, I think, um, I think it, it, it can give you a, a very different way uh, of looking at the reality. I think, you know, we, we've had plenty of conversations about um, the American culture and, 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 and the American media, for example, for anyone who's American, you know, I, I, I think the, there's plenty of great things in, in your country, but there are also things that um, created waves of um, unnecessary cultural disturbance in the world. I think um, I think the whole Hollywood, you know, business model of of telling us that we all need to be happy, telling us that life is black or white, that you're either a hero or a, vil- or a villain, and 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 that you have only one choice, um, and 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 you know, creating um, duality values that um i I think it 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 actually disturbed a lot of um, cultural stability in in many parts of the world i i think um happiness is is a relatively um, overused term term i think i I think happy end is is obviously something that all of us want but um life naturally brings suffering right it brings uh, illnesses and it bring, brings uh, tiredness it brings stress so the ability to be open to the suffering and and and, and really cherish it and I, I know it, it's, it sounds um, paradoxical but but um, receive the best from the suffering is is important I think and that's that's maybe um, the Zen conversation that we should have in the next video yeah it's it's remembering to do that. That can be a little bit tricky. Mm-hmm. I would say, at least in my experience, it's, it's noticing, you know, can you notice the suffering and see it as an opportunity to, uh, to adapt, to get acclimatized to something. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw an interesting talk recently about stress and, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges in, experiencing stress is not noticing it and not noticing when you've you've had enough and then your system starts failing stress yes. itself is really beneficial to to grow and yes strengthen you know if you use the they use the analogy of i, I believe it's called eustress which is positive stress which is like when you go to the the gym and you're learning to adapt more and more um, but if you get past a certain level you start to go into failure, which can happen emotionally. It can be yelling at your friends Uh and family. And so one of the biggest recommendations uh, that this speaker said, and I I apologize for not having her name handy. um, She was basically saying, sensitize yourself so you notice when you're stressed, so you can take it on actively uh, versus kind of, again, being back on (laughs) your heels, so. Yeah, it's inter- it's interesting. So uh, I'm working on my 14th book right now. Unfortunately, in Japanese, for anyone who can watch us right now in Japanese, I mean, sorry, in English. Um, and it's yeah. Um, are you ever going to translate these books? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I actually don't believe that they exist. They do exist. Uh, many of them exist. Um, actually, some of uh, my books have been translated into Chinese, Korean, and Thai. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still a bit, um, hesitant, uh, of translating them into English because they are written, um, with, um, well, Japanese or Asian people in, in mind. And, 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 mm-hmm. and there are some cultural, I think, um, nuances, and we, we can talk about those later on, um, that, that, that I, I, I do focus on, um, 
but I, I, I would love to uh, publish something in English. Uh, but anyway, uh, a, a big part of, of, of the book is actually ha helping people to increase their self-awareness and awareness of the environment or the situation around them. And uh, what's very important in, in that aspect is uh, recognizing biases. So for mm -hmm. example, Google had um, um, a lot of effort put into um, unconscious bias training and um, I, I think we, we, we do need to recognize, and from, from someone like you who's an NLP trainer, we do have patterns that are necessary for our um, well functioning, right? So we need to generalize. We need to figure out that this is a glass, right, to put water into it. Um, we need to be able to find um, relationships be, be, between events, uh, we need to be able to shorten things to the degree that allows us to communicate. But um, in many ways, our biases are actually functioning against us. So um, one bias that, that I, I just, you, you just reminded me of was uh, functional fix, fixedness, which is we only um, think of one tool in terms of the primary function we use it for. So for example, I've got this pen here on my desk. Mm. So we, we think of it as a pen, um, whereas we might think of it as a weapon or we might um, think of it as a, as, as a, a toy, scratcher. right? So, yeah, yeah, or a scratcher, right? So a cat, a little cat, kitten or a baby, um, they would not know that the pen is used for writing mm. and they would be playing with it. Right, so in a, in a sense, um, we we have we have this fixedness towards stress, right, and towards suffering, um, and especially in, in um, unfortunately in, in highly commercialized, um, well, um, market capitalist countries, we we think of anything that's unpleasant as as, as a tool. Um, to get rid of right mm. uh, immediately as as quick as possible so for example if we feel pain we immediately take a painkiller if we're uncomfortable with a relationship we immediately either break it or maybe seek therapy and and seek the proof that it was um, the other person that was wrong in, in that relationship maybe if we um, find a, a value or I believe that we are not comfortable with we seek proof uh, online of that of you know that the belief is actually wrong and um, it doesn't allow us to actually uh, take on new um, elements and to to learn to unlearn it doesn't allow us to prove to ourselves and maybe some of the, those beliefs and some of the, 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 the functional fixedness that we have is wrong, right? Um, actually, if you, if you are um, functioning in a, an environment that forces you to be functioning fast under stress, you um, forget your functional fixedness. So you may mm -hmm. realize that this, this pen is actually sharp and it can protect you if, if somebody's trying to attack you or if your back is itchy you can you can scratch it or maybe you know you can you can try you, you can try and, and hunt with it right um what, what actually um i think the majority of, of of people in um in developed countries don't experience is that stress of having to determine uh, how to use a tool how to use a belief how to use a um, an object or a subject against yourself or for yourself, right? And, and that actually, I, I do appreciate the, the hardships of living in a communist country, growing up in a, a small village in the mountains, um, in a family that um, was not educated and a village that didn't have anyone who went to high school. It, it actually mm. taught me what, what I think we all right now know as... Um, um do it yourself right mm. so diy is is probably the um the core of my identity in a sense i, I don't i don't see objects um and in, in the primary function i see them as possible possibilities for use in different ways um, mm. it's it's very interesting this idea of kind of um finding 
well, maybe it, it happens after the fact, but uh, we're, we're in a situation now where people are forced to adapt, whether they, whether they like it or not. And I think, I think many people hopefully will appreciate that in time because everyone is being asked to be a little bit more inventive than they have been, like, uh -huh. like you're saying. Um, I think we should, uh, we should pause the conversation there until next time. Um, so but, there is uh, still next time, Rob. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. You made a promise. Uh, yeah, I promise you there will be a next time. Um, so Rob, what do you want? Uh, that's a good question. And I will get back to you very soon. <laughs> but thank uh, you. Always thank a you pleasure. very much. Yeah. Enjoy your coffee and uh, may uh, the force be with you. All right. And may the Schwartz be with you.